Listen, Tommy gave me carte blanche up in this here joint, so. Good evening, I mean, good morning. Been here so long already, it looked like evening. I want to introduce to you uh, the Secretary Treasurer of Joint Council 16, and he's also Secretary Treasurer of Teamsters Local 553, representing now a very diverse group of people from people that are delivering oil. You still deliver coal? The, uh, no. It was the last coal. Yeah. The, about so historically, he's coal, now they're oil guys, and he's got bakery guys now and dairy people. Uh, Brother Demos P. Demopoulos. Thank you, my brother Chris. And I'm one of the few people who likes when there's a snowstorm because I re represent the bread, milk, and the oil guys. So I'm sorry for that, everybody else. Uh, it's an honor to be here today to talk to you. I want to thank um, Chris. I want to thank uh, Tommy Jaswali for uh, giving us this space today. And I want to welcome all my brothers and sisters from local 808, 812, 282. Raise your hand if I'm missing any locals. Good, I got everybody. Uh, this is great. Uh, uh, it's great to see that a uh, labor leader uh, like Clarence Thomas has written this book and that uh, Chris uh, described to us what it was all about and uh, we're glad to help promote it and we're glad that everybody came to the book signing and we'll be getting some more books too uh, to make sure that the uh, locals each have one uh, that aren't here today. Um, Chris, what, what would you, what, uh, how's the program go forward now? Oh, uh, thanks. I'm not often in this position, you guys know that, all right? But I got nobody to yell and scream at today, so. <laughs> I'm a little bit off, you know? I'm used to yelling and screaming and cursing lately on a picket line somewhere or a rally. But anyway, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. So we wanna thank all the locals that, that, that took the time to come today. Uh, I ask you, one of the good things about this book is that you don't have to just, you could jump around. You could read chapter one and jump to chapter six and come back to four and go back to nine and you won't miss anything. It's just a beautifully done anthology of what came out of uh, the Million Worker March in 2004, or October the 17th. And uh, we have done and moved so many things since that time. We see workers getting back up again as in Amazon, as in Starbucks. And uh, we've been a part of those struggles going back to 2004. However, I have to take this time to introduce, because out of that uh, march, I met truly my brother from another mother. Uh, number love for Clarence, uh, his wife Dolores, who is sitting in the back. And I would be remiss if we didn't recognize Sister Brenda Stokely. Sister Stokely, could you stand up? Sister Stokely and I were the Eastern Region Coordinators, and if you're ever in surgery, that sister is sharper than a scalpel. And so if you get into surgery and it looked like the scalpel don't look right, tell them to call Brenda, because she's sharper than that. Clarence is a third generation longshore worker. Oh, let me stop, forgive me. I also have to recognize my sister Leyland, uh, Sister Leyland who did so much work uh, on putting this book together. Uh, some would argue that it wouldn't be doable without her. Dolores is known as the comma queen uh, because there's not a comma in there that she didn't approve uh, or had removed. But uh, my brother Clarence is somebody who I sit at their feet in terms of just 
uh, labor history. They come out of the storied ILWU Local 10. For those of you who like Google, Google the name Harry Bridges, a uh, brother from Australia, another immigrant like myself, who came to America and attempted to change the world and in some ways did just that. I would be remiss if I didn't thank my brother Tommy Giswaldi for allowing us to have uh, this wonderful space that I haven't seen in so many years. Uh, but he was an integral part in making this happen. And I know that with leadership like Tommy going into the future, Joint Council 16 going to rise again. Uh, my brother uh, Angel, Joe Vida, uh, number mad love for you guys. You guys been there on every struggle, standing up for your workers and other workers. So I'm very thankful and grateful. At this point, without further ado, let me call to the stage my brother, now your brother, Clarence, the non judicial Thomas. <laughs> We're also asking if anybody didn't, we have a guest book in the back, we'd like you to sign that guest book, as well as uh, when this concludes, you know, you could get a, if you want your book autographed, if you want to take a photograph with Clarence, uh, we will be doing that after this. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to first of all thank Local 282 Joint Council for making this event possible. I know all of you had other things you could have been doing this morning. And I know one of the reasons why Chris wanted this to get started at 10 so that you could do your shopping and whatever other things you do on Saturday and not have to worry about not being able to do them. Let me first of all say that uh, I'm glad to be here. This is a part of a, I guess we could say a whirlwind book signing tour. I'm going to be speaking to workers at uh, TWU on the 21st of May, but this particular meeting this morning is very special, and I'm going to get right into it as to why. The Teamsters, longshore workers, represent two of the strongest industrial unions in the nation, if not the world. We also share a radical rank and file militancy at the point of production. In May of 1934, longshoremen on the West Coast, Teamsters in the Midwest, had a rendezvous with destiny. Both were part of important struggles in the history of the United States labor movement. The 1934 Teamsters Minneapolis strike and the West Coast maritime strike led by longshoremen in San Francisco. Local leaders associated with the Communist League of America led the Minneapolis Teamster Strike of 1934. The strike paved the way for the organization of over-the-road drivers and the growth of the Teamster Union. That along with the 1934 West Coast waterfront strike, led by Communist Party USA and Toledo auto worker strike led by America's Workers Party, were important catalysts for the rise of industrial unionism in the 1930s, much of which was organized through the Congress of Industrial Organizations. Bloody Friday is the name of the event which occurred in Minneapolis, Minnesota on July 20th, 1934, when police shot at truck drivers that were flying pickets. In other words, a group of pickets moving from one place to another, injuring 67 picketers and killing strikers John Bellar and Henry Ness. An investigation ordered by Governor Floyd B. Wilson determined, quote, police took direct aim at the pickets 
and fired to kill. Physical safety of police at no time endangered. No weapons were in possession of the pickets in the truck. At no time did the pickets attack the police. Solidarity strikes took place by workers to protest the shooting. The governor declared martial law and deployed 4,000 troops. On July 24th, 100,000 people lined the streets of the route of the funeral procession for Henry Ness. The strike was pivotal in making Minneapolis to have a strong union tradition and, and is widely seen as a critical moment for the Teamsters and the labor movement. This outcome led to the enactment of legislation acknowledging the right of workers to organize. The strike ended on August 21st. That's the date I'll never forget because that's the date I was born. July 5th, 1934, marked the turning point in the West Coast waterfront strike. One of the demands was to end the shape up where in the morning, longshore workers would gather in front of the ferry landing in San Francisco to beg for jobs and pay bribes, kickbacks, such to get a day's work. Offering a jug of wine, a bottle of whiskey, sometimes even sexual favors from a wife or a woman friend. The union also demanded the right to a workers control hiring hall to end the shape up and a six hour work day so that work could be shared on the West Coast with their union brothers during the depression. On July 5th, employers tried to force open the San Francisco port by running scab trucks with police escorts at Pier 38. The police tear gassed unarmed strikers. At least 100 strikers and their supporters were injured. Three workers were shot by plainclothes police officers outside the union's headquarters. And um, one of, of those particular, one of those members who was shot survived. The other two, Howard Sperry, a longshoreman and a World War I veteran, and Nick Bordois, a union cook and strike supporter, were both shot in the back and killed. This date is known as Bloody Thursday. Teamsters had Bloody Friday. Longshore workers had Bloody Thursday, all in May of 1934. The following day, thousands of strikers, families, and sympathizers took part in a funeral procession down Market Street in San Francisco, stretching more than a mile and a half. 11 days later, a general strike took place in San Francisco. Two days following the passage of the strike vote, 150 workers did not go to work, including Teamsters. The city was paralyzed for four days. A total of six workers were shot or beaten to death on the West Coast by police or company goons during the strike, which lasted for 99 days. Rather than break the strike, these terrible events galvanized public support. Bloody Thursday, similar incidents up and down the coast created a wave of rank and file unrest that conservative American Federation of Labor Leaders were unable to stop. This gives you some idea as to why our two respective unions are so strong. This is our history, brothers and sisters, and it is a hidden history. One of the things that I want to talk about right now is International Workers' Day, otherwise known as May Day, which the Million Worker March movement pledged to reclaim. And this is why. As an African American, I know quite well what the enslavement of African Americans has meant to me my family, and to many, many generations of African Americans who've lived on these shores. We have been denied our names. We've been denied our history, our culture, our traditions. 
and our freedom. But on the other hand, International Workers' Day, which so many people think is a communist holiday, yes, it is. It is an official holiday in socialist countries. But it started here in the United States of America. May Day is as American as hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolets. Because it was in 1886, workers in Chicago who manufactured the McCormick Reaper cut down wheat. They were molders. They were in the forefront of the struggle for the eight hour work day. Because children, women, were all subjected to inhumane treatment as workers. Not to mention the men who work 12, 14, 16 hours a day. There's a common thread that runs through our history as it pertains to the question of labor. And that is the police represent the bosses, the state, the powerful, the privileged, and that still holds true today. And we need to understand that as the working class. No matter if we have relatives that are members of the police department, we have to understand the history and the role of what the police department is. And I say that for this reason. Whenever we have a picket, whenever there's some kind of a labor beef, when the police come out, they don't come out to stand in solidarity with us. They come out on the side of the bosses. That's their jobs. But this hidden history about the labor movement, because we don't grow up understanding how we got the eight hour work day. We don't grow up to understand the importance of labor solidarity. We don't grow up to understand that whether or not a person is black, white, Latino, trans, or straight, we are all working people. If you are unemployed, you still are a worker. If you have to get up and go to work every day, that's a common bond. To show you the extent to which the government and big business went to hide our common history of struggle, especially with regards to international solidarity. Workers all over the world stood up in attention when four men were martyred for supposedly throwing dynamite at the police department in 1886. Eight people were put on trial. Eight people were found guilty. It was a kangaroo court. But those four martyrs were hailed as heroes all around the world for standing up for the working class. There's a reason why the government and big business did not want the working class to be identified with that struggle. They gave us Labor Day that has no connection to anything with regard to our struggle. The reason why the Teamsters are who they are is because of this history that we share. Militancy. Working class people have an interest separate and apart from those who are in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party or any other group. I know we got Republicans and Democrats in this room. Their interest is not the same as ours. And I can prove it. Most people in this country would like to have national health care. Do we have it? No. Most working people in this country would like to have a living wage. A living wage today would really calculate to be somewhere between $25 and $30 an hour. And here we are talking about $15 an hour. You all know how expensive it is to live in New York. You can't live on $15 an hour. That's criminal. But yet, 
They want, the bosses want to make it appear as if there's something criminal about a worker, worker making six figures. But they applaud the Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and the others. Oh, oh, so wonderful. Oh, the Teamsters make too much money. The long show workers make too much money because they figure that we ought to be making the same wages as they pay people at Walmart. The interest of the rich and the Democratic and Republican Party, who's funded by those individuals, if they had their way, they wouldn't be paying any taxes at all. If they had their way, there wouldn't be any unions. But we have to make sure that our young people, that there are young people in this room today, that we did not get the eight hour workday, we did not get pensions, we did not get vacations because the boss loves us. We, get, we got that because people fought and died for that. We have our own class interest and there's nothing wrong for us standing up for it. Isn't it interesting? We don't have a labor party in this country. They have them in other countries. You don't have to be a socialist country to have a labor party. We don't have one here. You ever thought about why? Because they want us to, to believe that our interests are synonymous with the Republican and Democratic Party. Well, let's just take a look at that to see. Hmm. Other countries, they don't have to pay for their children to go to college because they believe that a nation that does not invest in its youth don't have a future. They believe that a country that really serves everybody would not be one with tremendous examples of income inequality. Why do we have homelessness? Why do we have poverty? We have those things because of the kind of country that we live in. Yeah, a decision was made. And we know this to be true because of the New Deal that gave us Social Security benefits, the right to organize, the GI Bill. These are all socialistic programs, sisters and brothers. And they fought Franklin Delano Roosevelt tooth and nail, called him a communist. When in fact, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was saving the country. We need to be very clear as working people that we have our own class interests. And that is what led to the Million Worker March. ILW Local 10 is the only African American longshore local on the West Coast. We initiated the idea of the Million Worker March because a young trade unionist by the name of Trent Willis who's a third generation longshore worker like myself, called me and said, Brother Clarence, what do you think about a million worker march? Well, I went to the million man march and there was almost two million men there. So I, first thing I thought about was, wow, when do you want to have it? He said, right before the convention. Well, gee whiz, that's less than a year. But you know, young people, they have bold ideas which is why we need to embrace them and work with them. To make a long story short, I don't know how many in this room remembers who was even running for president in 2004. Well, Bush was running, and so was John Kerry, senator out of Massachusetts. And he was running for Wall Street. He did not have a worker's agenda at all. He wanted to increase the number of troops going to Iraq. And it was very clear to us that 
despite the fact that carry, even if carry won, it wasn't going to mean anything different for working people. So we decided that we wanted to have a worker's agenda to be put forward to working people prior to the start of the convention. Great idea. We weren't trying to stop Kerry from being elected. My own local, my own union even endorsed him. But we were saying to working people, hey, we have our own needs and our own agenda, and we need to express what they are. So we started to mobilize. But something very curious happened. We met with a whole lot of resistance from the Democratic Party and the officialdom of the AFL CIO. This is a letter that was sent out by the director of mobilization for the AFL CIO. Quote, you may have seen a reference to a million worker march being called by a number of local unions, individuals, and organizations in mid October. While we may agree with many of the aims and issues of the march, the AFL CIO is not a co sponsor of this effort, and we will not be devoting any resources or energy toward mobilizing for a Washington demonstration this fall. Rather, we are completely focused on the critical importance of grassroots organizing for the national election schedule for November 2nd. We think it is absolutely critical that we commit the efforts of our labor movement to removing George Bush from office and electing candidates to Congress and at state and local levels who are committed to working families issues, we believe that the efforts of the entire labor movement need to be focused on the election. Now, isn't that curious? They want us to do all the heavy lifting, the grassroots organizing, knocking on doors. We're supposed to be the foot soldiers, but it's wrong for us to even have one day to talk about our concerns. I'm going to read something to you that was published, was sent out by Mike Mathis, Director of Government Affairs for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. It was directed to all local union and joint council principal officers. In September, this letter was sent out by the Director of Government Affairs, regarding the Million Worker March, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters is dedicated to grassroots activism to promote our political and legislative agenda. We are currently committed to massive mobilization to turn out more Teamsters than ever before to vote on November 2nd for John Kerry and John Edwards. It is critical during this time that we do not allow ourselves to be distracted by any activity that does not directly motivate Teamsters to go to the polls, especially in our targeted battleground states. We agree, as does the AFL-CIO, in principle with the idea of the Million Worker March. However, we also believe that the timing of the march will divert valuable time and resources away from our efforts in the battleground states. We would therefore encourage you to continue to work the Teamsters Election 2000 program in your state and, if possible, commit staff in time and resources in battleground states. If you have any questions, please contact me. So this goes to show how serious Act, steps were taken not for us to have this march. Our own international, which had come out in support of the march, decided that it was not in the interest of labor for us to do this march. There was a very historic meeting that took place in Hyannisport at the Kennedy compound on the weekend before the election, or should I say the weekend before 
the Democratic Convention in Boston, Massachusetts. A number, you could, I guess you could call it a, a mini labor summit because many of the leading international trade union leaders here in the United States of America were all invited. Brother James Hoffa was invited, Andy Stern, John Sweeney, uh, a man by the name of James Spinoza, who was the international president of the ILWU. They all gathered at the Kennedy compound. And lo and behold, you know what was discussed? The Million Worker March. Yes. They all agreed, oh, this is a great, great idea. But not now. We can't let anything get in the way. As if working people can't walk and chew gum. Isn't that, isn't, isn't that really arrogant? They were going, they cut them, we couldn't get money from anyone. They, they, they when, when these letters came out, they had a devastating effect. But something very curious happened. There's a brother by the name of Leo Robinson who's featured prominently in, my, in, in our anthology. He's a third generation longshore worker. To show you what kind of a guy he is, in, in the mid 70s after the Soweto massacres in South Africa, where uh, South African youth were murdered because they didn't want to speak the Africana language, he did something that we can do in democratic union. He wrote a resolution calling for the boycott of South African cargo to protest apartheid, and it passed. That led to longshore workers refusing to unload South African cargo for 11 days in 1984. This brother, Leo Robinson, is the individual that started that. Brother Leo Robinson designed this shirt that I'm wearing. Isn't it beautiful? I know it's beautiful because even uh, jaded New Yorkers have stopped me on the street to say, I said, where'd you get that shirt from? Young man? But they love this shirt. Leo designed this shirt, but he also put up $50,000 of his own money to finance these shirts, those buttons that I've been handing out, those beautiful brass buttons that I've been handing out. When the AFL CIO and the Democratic Party saw this, they said, what the heck was going on here? I thought you said we weren't gonna give them any money. <laughs> now they got shirts out. But now I'm gonna get closer to home. Chris Silvera made reference to his involvement with the Million Worker March. He and Sister Brenda coordinating, organizing the march on the East Coast. He invited me and some other members of the Million Worker March to the Teamster National Black Caucus Educational Conference in Orlando, Florida, I believe. Was that where it was, Chris? It was a beautiful, beautiful gathering. I had a chance to speak. He had an array of people there, some part of the Democratic Party. I think Donna Brazil was there that night, that day. They gave away books. It was a wonderful event at the Teams of National Black Caucus. But something very interesting took place after I got through speaking. Someone got up and made the motion that the TNBC, C. Thomas Keegan was right there, wasn't he, Chris? Yes, sir. Made a motion that the Teamsters gave $10,000 to the Million Worker March. Ooh, that wasn't supposed to have happened. <laughs> That's what happens when you have a democratic organization where workers can express themselves. And when their concerns and interests are different from the leadership, so be it. We got democracy. Despite that letter that I, that memo that I read that came from Brother Mike Mathis, 
The Teams has made good on that $10,000, on that million worker march. I want to give the Teams a round of applause. Hey, that's why I'm up here today. That's why this book is out. That's why I'm talking about our radical tradition, sisters and brothers. They gave that $10,000. Not only that, but Brother Hoffa also gave $10,000 the following year, in 2005, when the Nation of Islam was organizing the 10th anniversary of the Million Man March. I was at the Million Man March in 1995. You had Teamsters, you had long show workers, you had SEIU workers, you had people from all over the country, primarily working class people. But there were no unions represented up on that stage in 1995. That was changed 10 years later. Cur the courageous leadership of Brother Chris Sobera, we had a meeting with Minister Louis Farrakhan. We said, anytime that many workers are coming to a place, labor must have a seat at the table to discuss our issues. Minister Farrakhan agreed. Brother Chris Silvera spoke at the 10th anniversary. I spoke, and Sister Pat Ford, formerly of the SEIU, spoke before close to a million people, and I don't know how many others who were watching all over the world. But one of the most meaningful speeches that was given that day, because of who gave it and whom he represented, was Brother Chris Silvera, representing the Teamster, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, and the Teamster National Black Caucus. Do you think the attention wasn't on him? Of all the speeches that were given that day, this is somebody representing this, the teams. We got to listen to what the heck he's saying. Why is he up there? And Chris talked about Bush waiving the Davis Bacon Act and the rebuilding of the aftermath of Katrina. He spoke to that. It was a hell of a speech. You can still watch it right now on uh, C-SPAN. Now, I don't want to give Chris all the credit, but what I can tell you is that two weeks later, Bush changed that because what Chris was talking about, he was actually talking about labor, black folk, Survivors having a blockade down there. The survivors were Katrina hit to say, if you don't have living wages here, we have a response to what you're doing. Of course, the Democratic Party had been struggling to get that happening. But I don't want to downplay Brother Chris Silvera's influence on that. You know why? We have to document our own history, sisters and brothers, which is why I wrote this book. I thought Chris Silvera's speech was very important. It's recorded now for other generations to learn from. I just want to say one thing. You know, it's easy to say, we're going to reclaim May Day, have rallies. That's very important to put it back into the consciousness of the working class in this country. But Brother Chris Silvera went one step further. He actually negotiated May Day as a paid holiday for some of his workers in Stuyvesant Town. Well, some might want to downplay that as, oh, it's a few workers 
No, he was the first one to do it. Now, when all the others start doing it, because we rise up and demand it, and by the way, they just didn't switch holidays like, uh, oh, uh, you want to switch Dr. King's holiday for that? No. That day is important. That was a very historic. None of us could have ever imagined when we put forward the idea to reclaim May Day that there was going to be one of the organizers of the Dominion Worker March to be able to accomplish that. I'm going to wrap it up, give time so we can have some questions and so forth. But I just want to say this. This didn't come from my own mouth. This come from some other people's mouth. They say that this book is instructional, is accessible, and it needs to be in the schools so that young people will have the opportunity to learn how we can organize in our own name and have results. Let, let me just be very clear to everybody in this room. There's a lot of controversy today about the police department. Defunding the police and all the rest that goes along with that. The labor movement needs to understand that the killing of un arm African Americans and people of color is a working class issue. And let me tell you why it is. I've alluded to it several times here today. Police have a long history of killing workers during struggles. That's what they're instructed to do because the bosses don't want to make any concessions. I submit that if we really understood our labor history in this country, the labor movement would be much more involved in opposing police violence. It's a working class issue, brothers and sisters. It is. Let me put it to you this way. I talked about Bloody Thursday, July 5th, 1934. Two strikers got shot in the back by the police. Do you know that every July 5th, longshore workers do not work for 24 hours to commemorate the deaths of those two striking brothers who were shot in the back by the police? 24 hours, we do not work. It's called Bloody Thursday. And we get paid for it. We made the employers do that, because we would have did it anyway. And I submit that one of the problems with why labor does not take the issue of the police violence in the community much more seriously and relate to it is because we don't know our own history. We can't put it together. But the old timers understood it very, very well. I want to thank you for listening to me. I know some of you might have been a little shocked by what I was going to say today, but I'm only telling you the truth. I could go a lot further, but, I, but I've been warned by my wife not to overdo it. So I like to stop at a high point. But I want to thank the Teamsters for allowing me to be here today. I am very, very honored. I had a chance to meet one of the most dynamic trade union leaders that I know of today, Brother Chris Silvera. I had the chance to meet him through this struggle. He's a real trade union leader. He has class consciousness and he has trade union, trade union consciousness. And another thing I like about Chris, he has humor. And he knows how to use it to be able to get his point across. He knows very well who his membership is, what their politics are. But that does not stop him from speaking the truth. We have to engage in struggle, brothers. We, got long, we, we have workers that have different points of view. You know that. 
But one thing we know, we have our own self-interest and we should not be afraid to stand up for it. We should not. We owe it to our children. Some of them may want to be Teamsters. Are they going to have an opportunity to be Teamsters? You know, we're under 10% now in the private sector. We're under attack right now. They want to make it appear as if pensions are something passe. Our young people today don't even have pensions. Some of you may have children who have two degrees who may be living at home, who are working at Starbucks, Amazon, driving Uber, Lyft, to try to make what a Teamster makes or what a longshore worker makes. And they're trying to raise a family. That's not right. Their future is much bleaker than ours was. And that's a reality. So we have to come together and face these challenges. And that's why I'm so glad that I was offered the opportunity to speak here before you today. Thank you so much. And I'd just like to close out. There's a uh, slogan that's long associated with the ILWU, but it really started with the Wobblies, the IWW. It goes like this. An injury to one is an injury to all. Join me in saying it, please. An injury to one is an injury to all. One more time. An injury to one is an injury to all. In solidarity, when the work, if the working class is to be heard, labor must shut it down. Thank you so much. I just so y'all know, Demos is in tears up here. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, you wouldn't no. I, 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 it would be remiss if we didn't have questions that we might want to ask. I remember having clients at our local years ago and people really asked questions and it, he was able to clarify some of the thought processes of the speech he made. So please free to ask a couple of questions. Go ahead, my sister. I would like Clarence to uh, elaborate on, you know, because he told me that in the ILWU, the women make the same as the men, and how did that come to be? And also, is it the same in the International Brotherhood of Teamsters? Very good question, my sister. Uh, when I first arrived on the waterfront in 1985, I think there might have been three or four women who worked on the waterfront. Now it's 25% uh, or close to that. Yes, the women who are in the ILWU make the same as men. Black, black women make the same as white men, as white, white women make the same as white men. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Equal pay for equal work. And that comes from a tradition I'm just going to come out and say it. It's a socialistic idea. You know, when we organized that hiring hall, I don't know, there's a movie that Marlon Brando did many years ago. My father loved that movie. It was called On the Waterfront. Maybe some of you may have heard of it. But you get a chance to see firsthand how long show workers are subjected to the shape up, where the bosses pick and choose who can go to work based on ethnicity, uh, kickbacks, nepotism, and all that kind of stuff. The idea that workers would have a hiring hall and they would democratically dispatch the jobs, that was a revolutionary concept. Because they said that the shipping owners were the shock troops of capitalism and the longshore workers talking about having a hiring hall, what kind of Bolshevik Soviet propaganda is that. Workers don't control the hiring hall. Well, workers doing the work. We want to make sure that everybody gets a fair shake. They're all union members. So that idea of what we call the low man out system, the person who got the last job yesterday is the last person to get a job the next day. 
That's part of our dispatch system. That is consistent with why women make the same amount of money as men. They operate the crane. They operating a tractor. They operating container movement equipment. If they are, if, if they are part of uh, uh, administration, clerks working behind the computer, they make the same pay. And some of the women, better workers than the men. In some instances, yes. Yes. And this is very, and this is very important. It's a very important thing for people to understand. So yes, my dear sister, that's been, that's been happening for a long, long time. Anything else would be contrary to the ILW tradition. They also do the same in the Teamsters. Um, one of the things that our government has failed at, the NAACP has failed at, CORE, uh, church, you name it, it's only in a union environment where women get equal pay with men for doing the same type work. And that is the reason why we have to be supportive of the labor movement because the labor movement is the only movement in this country that brought equality into the workplace. So hands up to the labor movement. You know, when you get my age, you forget to do things, but I just, Chris, just jog my memory. You know, I was talking about that that mini summit that they had at the uh, Kennedy compound where Brother Hoffa and so many other trade union leaders were there. I'd like to read something to you. This was sent to me on July 28, 2021. Dear Brother Thomas, this is from the international president, was the former president. Thank you for the book you sent, mobilizing in our own name, Million Worker March. It looks incredible, and I look forward to reading the entire book. I'm thrilled that the Teamsters Union was featured and can't thank you enough for sending me a copy. So many of the things that we were calling for at the time are as relevant as ever. Your book shows what can happen when workers stand together. It also reminds us of the long road ahead to achieve dignity and justice for working people. Thank you again, and thank you for continuing to stand strong with our brothers and sisters working on the ports in California. Fraternally, James P. Hoffa, General President. And, and just let me say one thing. Let me say one thing. Brother Hoffa is a man who evolved. I can respect a person who evolves, because we're supposed to. But I remember so fondly in 2001, when Brother Hoffa came to our contract negotiations with the PMA and said, if there's a picket line, the teams will stand with the ILWU. The three strongest unions on the waterfront, ILWU, ILA, and the Teamsters. I never will forget that. And I never will forget the letter that Brother Hoffa sent or the support that he demonstrated for this struggle. Because he understood the importance of us being at that 10th anniversary of that Million Man March. Workers were gonna be there. We need to be there, expressing our point of view, organizing at every single opportunity. That's what trade unionists should be doing. We should always be trying to find common ground. We know what the story is. No matter how much money we make as Teamsters or Longshore workers, we're still workers. And when we look at what just unfolded in Staten Island, well, those workers were able to do something extraordinary. And Brother Chris O'Bara so eloquently pointed out when he said, this is one of the most important developments in labor 
since the organizing of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters by A. Philip Randolph. That wasn't an overstatement. The Teamsters are very aware of what a juggernaut it is to organize Amazon. And these workers in Staten Island did it. And what that should tell us is this. No one can speak for workers like a worker can speak for themselves. And we have to be there to support these young workers in any way that we possibly can. Sometimes it's a little hard because we got all the experience. Well, we can still share that experience, but put them out front. They've earned this right. They're looking for our support. Thank you. I'd like to call two people up here, uh, Brenda and uh, Brother Charles Jenkins. Brother Charles Jenkins is the president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists here in New York City. He's also a member of Teams of uh, Transport, well, it should be Teams, this Transport Workers <laughs> Union, Local 100. I don't know if we could buy him if we wanted to, I suspect. Uh, maybe we will. But uh, it, these are some of the people that were uh, participants and organized and mobilized uh, at that point, Local 100 was under the leadership of Brother um, Roger, Toussaint. Roger Toussaint, and uh, we're very supportive. Come on up, come on up. I want you. Uh, you have to hear, you got to get a couple of words from, from these two great leaders right here. We would be remiss if we didn't allow them to say a couple of words. Uh, me and them, Demo's going to be wiping the tears out of his eyes. Well, yeah. Brenda Stokely. It's story. I just want to challenge you all, because I know you all are bright, bright, brave people, you're smart people, and you have thoughts. Listening to your own history and knowing that you did not get that history in school. We did not get history about um, uh, people who, women, we did not get history about Native Americans or other immigrants that came here. That is hidden from us. And there is a reason for that. Because once you learn your history, like your family history, you feel more connected to something. You know that you just get, didn't come down off of a, 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 a ship somewhere. You came here and your families had to fight hard for dignity and for equality. And that's what it means when we say, I never try to say I want to be a middle class person. What the hell is that? That is not a caste. I am a worker, my father, my mother, they were workers just like in your families, and we should not be shoved under a rug because what it hides is not only what you do, but your strength and your power to do it. Imagine if one hour of the day or two hours that the Teamsters shut down, the Longshoremen shut down, ASME shut down, all the workers shut down, where, how, what would that city or state look like? It would be dead because we are the ones who give life to this city. We are the ones that give life to the country because we are the ones who build things. We are the ones that get the health care for people, the services. We are the people that run the buses. We are the people that do everything. And we are not making billions of dollars or trillions of dollars, this is coming off of our skin and our back. And we deserve to live in a society that accepts that and understands that. But if we are mute, if we do not stand up and speak for ourselves, if we do not put our feet and our bodies where they need to be when other workers need us, we're going to crumble. There are less than 7% of the workers in this country that are in unions. That's Horrific. In Europe, mostly everybody is unionized. You come to a place that was unionized, you don't have to go through all these shenanigans that they do here. You're going to be a, 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 a part of that union. So the thing is, but they didn't just get that way. They fought for that. They fought for that. And so we have to not just, in terms of closing our eyes and saying, well, this is not really about us, you know, I don't know really what people are talking about. 
And the world is about us. The world does not move. Nothing on this world moves without us. And so we should stand with our heads up high and all the dignity that we have and always infusing people. You can't get from one place to the other if a worker didn't get you there. You can't get your health care if a worker didn't do it. You can't get no food if a worker doesn't get it for you. So that's who we are. We are the salt of the earth. We are the people that keep things going. And we have every inch of this uh, country trying to say that that's not who we are. That that's that we're not, oh, they're just people. Have you gone to a restaurant where the worker comes and, and brings you your um, menu or something? Have you been in restaurants where people just look at the hand, they don't look at the person who's giving it to them? That's what they try to do. Of course, they try to act like we are not here. But that, we can't think that way. Every time you look in the mirror, I hope you see a strong, determined, dignified person there, whether it's a man or a woman or a child. You should never have your head down. You should never let somebody else tell you who you are. You should know who you are. And so that's why this book, we want this book to go to the schools. We want these books to go to the libraries. We want these books to be put in the hands of young people so they know what their father, their grandfather, their grandmothers did to keep them alive, healthy, and being smart about what they need and how they're going to get it. Thank you, and I appreciate having a chance to greet you. Our brother Charles Jenkins, TWU Local 100. They moved the city. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I greet you in the struggle. Uh, my name is Charles Jenkins. I'm a proud member of the Transport Workers Union, Local 100, a 34-year member of that powerful union, a 29-year officer of that same respected, powerful union, and the president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, New York chapter. I am extremely honored and proud to say a couple of words to you behind uh, what I just heard from our brother in the struggle, who I've had an opportunity to grow and learn under his powerful leadership in this labor movement, and that's none other than which who you heard from this morning, uh, Clarence Thomas. Thank you so much, brother, for documenting our struggle Brothers and sisters, as you've heard, if we don't document it, it did not happen. And I'm extremely proud to be able to, on a week from today, host this same forum in the halls of my union. That we bring this here message to every labor body in this here country to make sure that organized labor voice is not only heard, but the next generation, all of us that sits in this room, in this space, that we light the torch, light the torch of the next generation so that the struggle of organizing in our own name that is real, that is true, and that it certainly happened. So I'm honored to be here to hear from Clarence on this here powerful, powerful movement called the Million Worker March. And I would say to every leader in here, every single leader in here, you've heard so much about the Teamsters. If you have not read this book, the Transport Workers Union Local 100 is in this book. I was proud to organize members going down to Washington by the bus loads. And what a powerful, thrilling moment going down. But the return from so many people empowered by just the base, not the leadership, but the base 
being able to mobilize in our own name and speak truth to power about the needs of our class, and that's the working class. I implore everybody in here to not only read the book, but share this book after reading it. If you don't have another copy, to pass it on, because it's through us that this here labor movement lives on. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you. So, I, I, you know, we were going to tell him about Local 100 up at your hall. You know, just, <laughs> uh, today is our day. <laughs> but uh, we had workers from South Korea, Japan, South Africa, that came to Washington, D.C. on October the 17th and participated in that event. We have the power to shut the world down. And people need to understand, we might be 7%, but without this 7%, that other 93% got nothing to do. Because they can't do it without us. I mean, just look at the supply chain issue. If you remember when Joe Biden first came into power, the first people he met with was the longshore workers and the Teamsters because goods were clogged up in the ports and they had to move things and get things going and what have you like that. We still have the power. The question is whether we're going to use that power to advance the cause, not just of our members, but of the class. Because the union is the vanguard of the working class, both those that pay dues and those that don't pay dues, and we can never forget that. And I implore these locals to buy books for your stewards and have your stewards be educated as to what it took to get to where we are today because a lot of times I think they think it came like manna from heaven and they don't realize that people shed blood, got locked up. We have an eight hour day because people died. You know, people think it all happened in the hay market in 1886, but there was a struggle. There were eight hour leagues all across the country, all over the world and May 1st was selected as a day when globally workers would shut down. So we enjoy eight hour day. We need to be at a five hour day now. It's been 1886 to now. That's almost, we damn near into close to 200 years of eight hours. I'm tired of eight hours. And, and young workers today are working longer than eight hours. You, if you get on a train, they're on their computers, they get home, they're getting emails and stuff like that. So most people, when I started working, it was nine to five, one hour for lunch. Now it's nine to six, because you don't get a paid lunch anymore. This is what's happening quietly, slowly. You know, we laud Jeff Bezos, but we don't go out and participate. And I want to thank all of you that took the time, because everybody had something else to do. My sister Bernadette from Local 210 over here, I'd be remiss if I didn't see you. Uh, Joey Vida from 812 to 82. We all had something else to do. Who is that I can't see? Oh, man, stop. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got a new glass. I just got new glasses. It don't work. Uh, huh? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. That's my brother from Jamaica. They kind of militant. Uh, but thank you very much for coming up. But, but we have to mobilize our membership. We have to get our members re-engaged in this struggle. You know, and if we're not gonna, if we're gonna do that by giving them something to read so they can see that this is doable against the odds of the Air Favelle, against the odds of the Democratic Party, we were able to pull off a march that still continues to resonate to this day. And I want to thank all of you, each and every one of you, for coming here today, taking this time. We're going to uh, you can clip this out. We're going to do this video. It's going to be presented to the, the Joint Council's website. It'll be shared with our brothers at uh, CBTU and Tinkster's Local 808. And because uh, people need to understand that we still have the power. Who got the power? We got the power. Who got the power? We got the power. All right. Believe it. 
because we do have the power. We have the power to make it run, and we have the power to stop it from running. Thank you very much.